Hello? Hello? Hello, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, this is uh, Kingdom Hall of Jehovah's Witnesses? Yes. Okay. Uh, I had a question about um, the book, uh, What Does the Bible Really Teach? Would you be able to help me? Yeah. All right. Um, I have a... Uh, I, I was wondering if... Would you be able to... I don't have actually the booklet on me. What does the Bible really teach? Uh, would you be able to read... Ver I think it's. it looked like verse 11 on page 41. Okay. What chapter was it? Uh, uh, chapter 4, page 41. Yeah, I don't have the book right now. Okay. Mom right now. Mama, can you come? Uh, my mom's coming. Oh. Hello. Hi. Hey, uh, would you happen to have a copy of the booklet, What Does the Bible Really Teach? Let me see. Uh, in English, right? Yeah. Uh, my primary language. Uh, English is my primary. I'm sure there's one in the Kingdom Hall somewhere. Did you want to come pick one up or? Uh, well, I'm. Yeah, I'm. Probably not near you. Uh, you were the. I've I've been calling Kingdom Halls until I got a hold of somebody. I thought maybe on Sunday it'd be easy, but it turns out it's not. What can the Bible teach us? Yeah, we have that. Oh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have a. I have everything but a my copy of that booklet. I was wondering if you could read to me. Uh, chapter 4, page 41. It looked like it was in verse sections, like verse 11. It, it's like the middle of the page of 41, if I remember right. Okay. You know, it's also online. Uh, yeah. I, uh, yeah, I've been to the site, but I, I think for my question, I wasn't really able to get my question answered by the site. I think it requires a person. Okay, chapter four. And which um, paragraph you said? Uh, page 41. Uh-huh. Uh, it looked like it was in verse sections. I remember it being verse 11. Like paragraph 11? Paragraph 11. Okay, so it wasn't verses, it was paragraphs. I'm sorry. Uh, so is it the, where did Jesus come from? Yes, yeah. Uh, would you be able to read that for me? Sure. It says, Jesus is very precious to Jehovah. Why? Because God created him before everything and everyone else. So Jesus is called the firstborn of all creation. And that's from Colossians 1.15. Jesus is also precious to Jehovah because he is the only one Jehovah created directly. That is why he is called the only begotten son from John 3.16. Jesus is also the only one Jehovah used to create all other things. Colossians 1.16. And only Jesus is called the Word because Jehovah used him to give messages and instructions to angels and humans. John one fourteen. Oh, fantastic! Is that the entire paragraph? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I went to um, Colossians one fifteen, sixteen, and seventeen in the New World Translation. Um, oh, uh, do you have a Greek interlinear on your end? A Greek interlinear. I don't know what that means. I'm sorry. Oh, okay, it's Greek and linear. I've got one. I mean, I can read it on this end since I have one available. Um, 
Well, I'll wait to do that. I've got, I've got a Greek interlinear for verses 16 and 17. But before I go there, um, I wanted to uh, look at a word in verse 15, which I, I looked this up uh, in pertaining to this uh, since the Jehovah's Witnesses had taken me to that part of what does the Bible really teach. And then we went to um, Colossians 1, 15, 16, uh, through 17. Now, I can read it out of the um, New World Translation real quick if you want. Um, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, because by means of him, all other things were created in the heavens and on the earth, the things visible and the things invisible, whether they are thrones or lordships or governments or authorities. All other things have been created through him and for him. Also, he is before all other things, and by means of him, all other things were made to exist. That's the uh, New World Translation. Okay. Um, and uh, in verse 15, uh, the word firstborn in the Koine Greek, Koine Greek is the Greek of the New Testament. It's classical Greek. It's not modern Greek. Um, the word for firstborn is prototokos. Are you familiar with that word? Have you heard it before? No. Okay. Um, it's actually... That word is very rarely used inside of and outside of the Bible in Koine Greek manuscripts that we have. And uh, so since it was very rare, it you know piqued my interest to look into it. I looked up some definitions for it too. The primary definition is preeminent. And some definitions for preeminent are foremost, supreme, and exalted. Now, uh, I looked, I wanted to see why Paul used the word prototokos, since it's so rarely used in the Greek. Um, and the reason I found, this is the reason that I found that he used it, is that it is very significant to the Hebrew history, to Hebrew history, in a way that sets it apart from Gentile cultures, and specifically because it points to the Messiah right here in Colossians. Um, in Gentile cultures, uh, the birthrights of the firstborn went to the son who was born first. Even if a girl was born first, the 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 firstborn right, the birth rights of the firstborn still went to the firstborn son. That's how patriarchal societies do it. In fact, I would say that our society today is primarily patriarchal in that way. Uh, you're familiar with that, right? That it's usually the firstborn son that receives inheritance or birth rights. I guess I'm one of three girls. <laughs> okay. It's unique. I mean, it, it's true in Hebrew culture, too, but not every time. There are exceptions. Um, with Abraham, he had a son, Ishmael, first. He was the firstborn. Mm -hmm. But the firstborn, the rights of the firstborn, which were the covenantal promise to Abraham, went to Isaac. Mm -hmm. And he was born second. And that's Genesis twenty-one twelve. But God said to him, do not be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. So we see that uh, the, the firstborn rights actually went to Isaac, even though he was not in birth order, the firstborn son. And then Isaac himself has two sons, Jacob and Esau. Are you familiar with them? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, Esau is the older son, but the... It's it's Jacob who is chosen uh, to receive the uh, rights of the firstborn, mm -hmm. um, and it, which is a covenantal blessing, and he has his name changed by God to Israel because of it. Mm -hmm. There's an incident there where he actually physically wrestles all night with God, and then uh, God uh, changes his name to Israel. And then out of Jacob's sons, uh, I apologize, I've got something in the background here, something loud. Um, uh, Joseph was the youngest son of Jacob, and he became the right hand of Pharaoh. But he, he was chosen over Reuben, who was the oldest son, to receive the rights of the firstborn. And then you've got King David, who was chosen over all of his older brothers. Now, if we take... 
what Paul did in Colossians. Am I am I cutting out on you at all? No. Okay. If we take what Paul did in Colossians and apply prototokos to Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and David, we actually get the true meaning of what prototokos means, which is rank, not nature. Because they were not born first, they were firstborn. Not in order of birth, but in position, if, if you understand what I'm saying. I don't know if I'm raising the fog level high on you on this. Um, these patriarchal sons were exceptions to the rule because they received the rights of the firstborn, even though they weren't physically the firstborns. Okay. Do you follow me there? Mm, yeah. Like David, if I remember right, David was the youngest of all of his brothers. Mm -hmm. Yet he received the rights of the firstborn. Okay. Uh, so what ended up happening is that prototokos is such a rare, rare word. So if we go from there and we read... Um, I'm going to read from the Greek interlinear, if that's all right, um, verses 16 and 17 real fast. I won't take too much of your time. I'm going to move along quickly so I don't keep you tied up real long. Uh, I'll read it. I don't know if this is all going to make sense because when you do word-for-word -word Greek interlinear, it's not always proper English because it's word-for-word -word out of the Greek. But I'll go ahead and read it. Uh, because by him were created all things in the heavens and upon the earth. Uh, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or lordships or rulers or authorities, all things by him and for him have been created. Now, the bit of trouble that I have is that uh, in the New World Translation, I'm finding the word other in there, in the New World Translation, but I'm not finding it in the Greek interlinear. Uh, it, just, it troubles me a little bit. The word other? Yeah, it's inserted into uh, verses um, 16 and 17 like four times. It seems to be changing the meaning of the word prototokos from meaning position to meaning nature. If we take the word other out of verses 16 and 17, the word prototokos holds its original meaning. But if we insert the word other into those two verses, it changes the meaning of the word prototokos. It forces it to mean nature instead of position. Now, this is kind of a deep, this is something to digest, okay? So I'm not, I'm not expecting you to just completely understand everything I've just given you. Because it, it would take time to kind of mull this over and get a hold of it completely. It's quite a bit of information. And it's kind of some deep information. It doesn't just digest real quick. Yeah, especially because I read the Bible in Spanish, not in English. Um, but is there anything I can help you with apart from reading the paragraph for you? Uh, yeah, uh, I don't know anything about the the word prototokos. I don't. I was just I just found you were teaching me about it. I don't really. Know oh, okay, okay, it. yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I learned about it because um, really the reason I, I learned about the word prototokos was because of the word other in the verses sixteen and seventeen. And when I saw that they weren't there in the Greek interlinear, then I also went to examine. Um, I went to. But it's in parentheses, right? Uh, no, I don't think so. At least not in what I'm looking at. Oh, in Spanish they have it in parentheses. Oh, do they? Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't, for me, it doesn't seem to be <clears throat> clarifying the passages. It seems to be altering their meaning. Specifically altering the meaning of verse 15. But, uh, what I'm finding is that prototokos well, things have been created by him and for him. Now, if you take the word other out of there, it'll mean that he created all things, not all other things. It, it would, if, if you remove the word other, he's no longer part of the creation. He's actually the creator 
of everything. Uh, what I would what I would just you know uh, encourage you to do is to read those three verses in a Greek interlinear. Uh, a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses have tablets now. I'm sure if you ask them when they're there at the Kingdom Hall to show you the Greek interlinear online, they'll show it to you. And if you read it word for word from the Greek interlinear, and then you read the New World Translation version, you'll see that the word other is changing the nature of Christ, basically. It's really changing the nature of Christ because if you put other in there, he's part of the creation. He's the first part of creation, creating the rest of creation. If you take the word other out, he's not created at all. He is the creator of everything. That word other is critical because it is interpreting the nature of Christ. Okay. And then the word prototokos is derived from uh, Greek, I mean Hebrew culture, to point to Christ, to his preeminent position as the creator of everything. Now, I've got another verse that I went to in the Greek interlinear that the reason I went to this is because it was helping me to deal with uh, Colossians 15, 16, and 17. Because if Jesus is, if you take the word other out, he's a creator of everything. And so I went to this verse in the Greek interlinear as well, and it's John 20, 28. And I'm just going to read it word for word out of the Greek interlinear. Uh, we want to remember that Tom is, Thomas is a first century Jew for whom blasphemy, I'm pretty sure, would be a death penalty uh, or at least a very strong rebuke from his rabbi. And his rabbi is Jesus himself. Uh, in 2028, he's seeing Jesus after he's resurrected. He's got the nickname, you know, Doubting Thomas because he doubted the resurrection. Uh, but this is what he says to Jesus. Answered Thomas and said to him, the Lord of me and the God of me. So this is what Thomas is saying to Jesus. He's, he's saying to Jesus, the Lord of me and the God of me. And Jesus as his rabbi does not rebuke him for that. Now, in, as a first century Jew, that would be blasphemy to say that to a human being unless they are deity, unless they are God. Now, I have a way to help clear that up. Uh, if we go to um, Psalm, if we go to the Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7, I'm, I'm just going to read Psalm 45, 6 and 7. Do I still have you with me? Mm-hmm. Okay. Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. Now, that's Psalm 45, 67. Now, we both see that verses 6 and 7 in Psalm 45 are speaking of God, right? And his uh, kingdom, and that he will... His kingdom is going to last forever and ever, and he loves righteousness and hates wickedness. Mm -hmm. Now, can you go to Hebrews chapter 1, verse, verses 8 and 9? Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to read it or would you want me to read it? That's fine, you can read it. Okay. But about the sun, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. So now, we agreed in Psalm 45 that it's talking about Jehovah is that right 
I guess. I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, who is God? The Jehovah is God, yes. So 45 would be talking about Jehovah then, wouldn't it? Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7. I, I assume so. I don't remember what it says anymore. Uh, I'll read it again real quick. Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. Now, at the beginning, I would assume that that's got to be, to you, speaking of Jehovah, uh, your throne, O God. And of Jesus, I guess, because he's anointing somebody. Right, uh, because where it's applied to Jehovah in Psalm 45, it's now being applied to Jesus in Hebrews 1, 8, and 9. Because verse 8 starts off saying, but about the Son, he says, and then it repeats Psalm 45, 6, and 7. Do you see the connection? Do I still have you? Mm hmm also, he says about the angels, he makes his angel spirits. Uh, yeah. Master is a flame of fire. Actually, look, one, I think mm -hmm. that's that's probably verse uh, 7, right? Mm -hmm. uh, could you read verse 6? But when he again brings his firstborn into the inhabited earth, he says, and let all of God's angels do obey sense to him. Also, he says about the angels. He makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Now, wouldn't verse 6 separate him from being an angel? He says that his firstborn into the inhabited earth, like he's in a different... Um, because Jesus is like archangel. He's more, he has a, a different rank than the other angels. Are you sure about that in verse 6? Well, when he again brings his firstborn into the inhabited earth, he says, and let all of God's angels do obeisance to him. Now that includes all the angels, right? Wouldn't that also include Michael the archangel? But Michael is Jesus. Well, I know you've been taught that, but I don't think that agrees with verse 6 there. Or okay. with or with verse 8. I mean, because look at verse 8, what it's saying about the Son. Whoops. Do I still have you? Mm-hmm. Okay. When you look at verse 8, it's setting him apart again from the angels. Because it's yeah, a... It, it's a rule. Mm-hmm. It's applying... not going to rule. Right, right. Because it, in, in verse 8 and 9 of Hebrews, it's applying Psalms 45, 6, and 7 to Jesus. And I think it would be blasphemous to apply Psalm 45, 6, and 7 to an angel, wouldn't it? To Jehovah. It's not an angel. It's about Jehovah. Uh, in Psalm, right? In Psalm 45? Mm-hmm. And now, Jesus. yeah, but wouldn't it be blasphemous to apply Psalm 45 to an angel? To any other angel? To any angel at all. Psalm 45 is speaking about Jehovah. Mm -hmm. But it's being applied to the Son in Hebrews 1, 8, and 9. Now, if the Son is an angel, wouldn't that be blasphemy to apply what's said about Jehovah? Jehovah's giving Jesus the authority to rule over the earth. So it's not. Yeah, but look at, can you read verse 8 of Hebrews chapter 1? This is the Father speaking to the Son in Hebrews. But about the Son, he says, God is your throne forever and ever, and the scepter of your kingdom. Okay, I was just trying to see if... Um, you had any understanding on these uh, passages as far as how they are translated in the New World Translation and the and the conclusion that they come to? Yeah, no, I only have like Spanish 
versions of the Bible in the English New World Translation, but I don't have any of the original scriptures. And even if I had it, I don't know any other languages, so I couldn't tell you. Well, no, I don't. I'm not. I'm no Greek scholar either. I mean, that's why it's a Greek interlinear. Uh, I I would encourage you to look at the Greek interlinear when it comes to the New Testament Greek, because even in the Old Testament, you can do it with the Old Testament too. But um, you get precision with it. And so what it'll give you is it'll give you word for word translation into your modern language. So it goes directly from the Koine Greek right into your present day language, which when it does that can speak uh, improperly. Like the constructions in English when it's word for word are not. What's that? Um, I translate sometimes from Spanish to English or from English to Spanish when the doctors need me to translate for a patient. And sometimes word for word doesn't work. You have to translate the idea. That's right. That's exactly right. And that's sometimes kind of what happens with the Greek interlinear is that you get – you don't get pro – if you do it with English, you don't get proper English every time. You get kind of improper English, uh, especially because when you deal with uh, articles like the word the – uh, English requires the article the in places that the Greek doesn't, and so it can really sound improper in the in the English. But uh, it still will help you to go to a Greek interlinear because if you go from Greek interlinear to Spanish or Greek interlinear to English, you'll find out exactly what the Word of God is, is saying. And if someone has, you know, kind of. Uh, messed with the translation because the job of a translator is not to interpret the word of God, but merely to translate it. What I'm concerned about with the New World Translation is that it hasn't just been translated, but it's been it's used to interpret the word of God as well. Well, I not, do believe that the Holy Spirit has guided our translators to translate it in the way that the ideas are supposed to be. Because if you would translate it word for word, it wouldn't make any sense. I don't know. I read I read uh, Colossians one sixteen and seventeen in English, and it still made pretty good sense. Yeah. It just didn't have the word. It just didn't have the word other in there. Yeah. Okay. Well, I will pray for myself to understand the word, and you pray for yourself. I'm sorry that we disagree on this. No, that's okay. Yeah, and I will. Okay. Uh, you have a good afternoon then. You too. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.